Hey everybody and welcome to episode number 41 of Mixed Martial Analysis and in this episode what I kind of want to do is I just want to get through the prelims real quick. I don't want to jump into any like news or opinion or like try to break down any topics really circulating in the world of MMA but I really just want to get through the four fights on the prelim card and kind of break those down and give you my predictions for those. So this podcast is going to be a little bit more condensed and then tomorrow I'm almost done getting my notes and stuff ready for the main card. So tomorrow I'll release a podcast going over my picks for the main card and we'll get into some more topics and news and getting a little more in depth with things then. But today, keeping it simple. Um, that being said, if you guys have, I mean, as always, throw your fucking opinions in the comment section, right? Like there's so many things that a lot of people sometimes comment there and I'll be like, oh fuck, I didn't even consider that. But and I, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? But it helps me out moving forward because then I can go, oh shit, like for example, uh, one guy just pointed out that Bryce Mitchell just got his black belt recently. And I, when I went to like Wikipedia, it said Brown and I think they just recently updated it. So, um, you know, com- but by you guys commenting and us interacting on there, it just like, it, it not only helps the channel, right. But it also helps. I mean, it, the conversation just expands everybody's knowledge. So when you guys are commenting on shit, I hate this about the MMA community. They, <laughs> they tend to be very like tribal about, fights and stuff like you're not really allowed to just casually watch fights like if your friend just casually watches them it's almost like oh well he's not a hardcore fan oh he doesn't know this and people are mean to each other in comments man like i've never understood why when people comment on shit it's got to be like an attack Uh, or like when they comment on something they'll say um well did you know this well why can't you just like be like why can't you just state it more fairly so when you guys are commenting on shit on the channel be nice to each other um if you are using it collaborate you know what i mean like use it use it to expand your knowledge of mma there's no way you know everything right there's no way i know everything there's no way anyone does so use it as a that's how i mean if i wanted this channel like the one goal that i have for it is for it to be a place where like mma is i mean discussed in a rational and i mean like i said from from an educated perspective like I said, I don't claim to know anything. I'm going to do a lot of these picks, and I'm going to get a lot of shit wrong. I'm going to say some shit on here that a lot of you guys are going to go, what the fuck is he talking about? And that's probably because you guys are just going to have more in-depth knowledge in other areas, right? Like like I said, just be nice to each other when you comment, and keep things educational. Like, we're all here to learn from each other, right? So don't be dickheads in the comments. I hate, I hate when, I especially hate when I see two MMA fans being mean to each other. I'm like, what are you being mean about? Like, why are you being a dickhead? You're not involved in the fight. You're not like, you're, you're not why are you getting so emotionally invested in being right about something? Like it's okay to be wrong about shit and it's okay to like have your opinions on things, but just keep them respectful. Anyway, that's my rant on that. Also somebody else commented and they made a good point because I've thought about this a lot before that there's something wrong with the name. And when I think about the name mixed martial analysis, it is a fucking mouthful. And I also think that like, I want to launch a website at some point. And if I were to ever go in there and like, register a domain name and i've done this by the way and i canceled it because i was like eh, it's just not working mixed martial analysis.com it doesn't exactly roll off the fucking tongue it's a mouthful so um i'm actually thinking about changing the name of this channel if you guys have any suggestions please leave them in the comments i'm i'm more i'm not like i said to the kid who commented i'm, I'm not married to the idea of the name i just needed something it was kind of like a play on mma and you know that's where we're at but uh some exciting news i did just uh cross 100 subscribers on the channel so thank you very much to each and every one of you much appreciated otherwise i'd just be talking into nothing right so uh, thank you thank you to everybody who subscribed so far and um yeah without further ado let's let's get into breaking this card down today so the very first matchup on the prelims which i believe are going to air on espn on saturday are it's a middleweight bout between number 10 ranked Jacare Souza and, uh, or I'm sorry, number 14 ranked Jacare Souza and number 10 ranked Uriah Hall. And this fight is super interesting because it's like, you've got a guy in Uriah Hall who's very dynamic and explosive and his striking is very quick and snappy and he's got a great jab. And then you've got a guy in Jacare Souza who is obviously, obviously renowned for his jujitsu is renowned, like world renowned, right? He's I think you could safely say that Jacare Souza is the most accomplished jiu-jitsu practitioner in the middleweight division and one of the most accomplished in all of the UFC, without a doubt. His jiu-jitsu is beautiful. He's got – and he's 
like I said, these two have a little bit different styles, whereas like Jacare fights very heavy on the front fort and he's marching forward and he's got, I mean, he's got power in his hands too. And he, he does, he's much more willing to sit down on his punches. Whereas Uriah Hall is going to be doing a lot more movement, a lot more dancing, a lot of trying to, he's probably going to try to do a lot of drawing Jacare into his striking range while keeping his back off the fence, because that's where they can engage in the clinch. And if you look back through Uriah Hall's career, there are examples of people like, I mean, uh, like Gegard Mousasi, for example, when he got him to the ground, was able to dominate him there. And there are other ones I can't think of them off the top of my head, but there are other situations where Uriah end up on the ground. He can get back to his feet and he can survive sometimes, but like if he, uh, oh, uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. is another example. Like I just think that one of the dangers in fighting Jacare for Uriah Hall is that when he gets into these grappling situations, as good as Antonio Carlos Jr. is and as like good as Musasi is, and st- they're not Jacare on the ground, right? And I think that Jacare, especially if he can – Jacare is not really a bottom guard player. He's more – I mean, you can tell by the way he's built that he's obviously built to put pressure on people. He's fucking dense. Like I said, he just – he's a big guy. And I think that at some point – this is just how I see the fight going, right? And like I said, you always have to rely on – the not rely on it, but like take into consideration the unpredictability factor of Uriah Hall, because he'll also, there are, I mean like Bevon Lewis, uh, Bevon Lewis, uh, other people throughout, I'm trying to fucking think like, well, the first Musasi fight, I think in the first round, he either knocked him out in the first or second round. I can't remember, but early on you were kind of like, fuck, I think Musasi controlled him on the ground. And then Uriah landed this, that spinning kick to the body in the second. I might be remembering the fight wrong. I apologize if so. But my point is that when you back Uriah Hall into these corners, he's like a caged animal, right? And then he, it's like he's got to react somehow, and sometimes he'll end up with these brilliant knockouts. But it's almost like – and tell me, tell me what you guys think about this. This is just the vibe I get from watching Uriah Hall fight. I always just feel like you, you have to put him in a situation where he has no other choice but to respond when he's going to pull that shit out. I think he always has struggled throughout his career, and he kind of talks about the mental aspect of MMA. He kind of struggles to let his hands go and really put things together, but when you back him into a corner and he doesn't have a choice, he shines. The problem is going to be that opportunity is not going to come on the ground. I think Jacare is going to be marching him down, keeping his hands high, and it's not like Uriah Hall can't finish him. But he's going to have to be very active, very aware. He's going to have to be aware of so many different things because Jacare is just going to, like I said, continually march him down. And I'm looking for Jacare to put Uriah Hall's back up against the cage and start engaging in the clinch. And, like, this is one of those fights where I think Jacare has a clear advantage on the ground. And Uriah Hall potentially – I say potentially because, like I said, you don't know what you're going to get – get, you don't know what you're going to get out of him sometimes. So Uriah Hall potentially has an advantage on the feet. But Uriah Hall does get backed up. He does engage in a lot of clinch battles. And he, like, he has a wonderful jab, and he snaps it out there. And it's like, like I said, he, he does so many things so well. But I, I, I just think over the course of this fight in particular, it's, in, it's just a matter of time before it gets to the cage. And once it gets there, I think Jacare is going to be significantly better than Hall on the ground. And I think he'll be able to get to the fight to the ground. So I'm going with Jacare. I think like a second round submission. I think you'll kind of see like, I could see this fight going in waves a little bit where like Jacare takes him down and then Uriah Hall manages to work back to his feet. And then maybe he's landing some volume on Jacare and the output from Jacare will slow down and then he'll have to pick it back up when he regains his energy. And then it. I think that Uriah Hall will be able to survive relatively well early. And that'll be a little bit exhausting for Jacare and the more that the fight goes on and the more that like Uriah Hall starts finding success on the feet like if he's able to find that distance and stuff Jacare is going to have an even a higher sense of urgency to get to this fight to the ground so I'm going with Jacare late second maybe early third round submission but like I said never never count out the unpredictability and the I mean his striking is clearly very advanced don't don't count Uriah Hall out of this fight because he could end it at any time I just think that like you also I mean one of the things to keep in mind is obviously that Jacare has serious power in his hands and that he can box like if you go watch him fight Chris Weidman I'm not saying Chris Weidman is by he's not like an Israel Adesanya in terms of like his setups and his versatility and the variety and his attacks and stuff right but he was 
he was fighting well in that fight on the feet and Jacare was just able to overcome it and start marching him down. And I think that like a lot of Uriah Hall's really explosive movements and some of his best weapons are going to happen when he has some space. And I think Jacare is always going to be like just pressing forward like a zombie and he's just going to be willing to eat some of that stuff. And I think that like it's going it, to – the way that Jacare advances and cuts the octagon off – it's going to be kind of hard for Uriah Hall to get that range that he wants and land at the end of the shots where the most explosion will be. I think the Jacare is going to keep it close, and he's going to look to engage in a lot of clinch and, and ground fighting in this one. So Jacare, late second, early third, early third round submission. Not sure. Like I said, don't sleep on Uriah Hall, though. He could end it at any time. Okay, moving on. We've got a women's straw weight bout between number seven ranked Carla Spar- Esparza and number eight ranked Michelle Watterson. And, um, this, to be honest, out of all the fights on the prelims that we're going over right here, I feel like I have the most confidence in who's going to win this one. And watch, I'll say that. It'll, my, my guess will be completely fucking off. But when you watch Carla Esparza fight, her style is primarily boxing and wrestling. And the problem is that she's a really good wrestler. Carla Esparza, by the way, very important for the women's strawweight division, right? Like a very, she's a staple of the sport. Like, she's very good but when she went up against Tatiana Suarez you got to see the difference between like her grappling and elite I mean like really high level grappling right Tatiana Suarez is probably the most impressive grappler in women's MMA that we've ever seen most accomplished probably too right so you got to see that like there's a difference there and you know Carla Esparza's fought everyone man and it's like you kind of know what her style's like and she's got Michelle Watterson's going to be a little bit longer than her and I really like the fact that Michelle Watterson has the option to go into her toolbox and pull out the kicks, whereas Carla's not going to have as much versatility with her kicks. Not that she can't throw leg kicks, but her kicks are never going to be as refined or as smooth as Michelle's. And I think that like a lot of the success that Carla Esparza finds is because she's putting pressure on people, engaging in boxing exchanges and then like hitting pe- getting people off the break and sh- hitting people off the break and doing things that veterans do right but michelle waterson's a veteran as well i mean she's got a record of 17 and 7 carla sparza's 15 and 6 i mean these girls have over like 40 fights combined so both are veterans but i i really think the big difference here will be the kicks and this is why i think that if michelle waterson can start working the kicks it's going to keep Carla Esparza at range. And I think early on in the fight, like the first round, you're going to see that kind of like, it's not going to frustrate Carla too bad. Um, but as the fight wears on, it's going to, for, she's not going to be able to get into the range that she wants, and then she's going to start hunting for takedowns. And when you start getting backed into a hole, right, where like the takedown becomes the clear, obvious option, that like that that's going to be your path to victory when that when that becomes like your only way to win the opponent knows it and i think that carla will eventually start um setting up sh- not setting up shots she's going to start shooting without setting them up and i think that that's going to play into the hands of michelle waterson because like with the kicks michelle's going to be keeping her at bay and carla if she can't set things up with the hands her only other option is to cut the octagon off and try to force the fight up against the cage or she's going to have to get a takedown. And if she can't set the takedown up with her hands and she's not able to back Michelle up against the cage, which I think is going to be the case, I think Michelle's footwork is going to keep her circling around the octagon. That's going to cause Carla to take ill-advised shots. They're not going to be set up and she's going to be far away. And I think that's really going to play into the judo skill set of Michelle Watterson. Her nickname's a karate hottie, but don't forget that she has like nine submissions in her career out of 17 wins. So most of her wins come via submission. She has really good jujitsu. And I'm not positive that she's going to be able to take Carla out. Like, I don't know if she's actually going to be able to tap her, but I do think that like like I said, she's going to be kept at bay and then Carla's going to get over – she's going to get – I don't know what the word is, right? Over anxious, over eager, over excited and go for takedowns that aren't there. And it will really play into the judo of Michelle Watterson because she'll be able to use that momentum to set up her takedowns. And you see her hit that stuff all the time, hip tosses and stuff. So Carla has to be very careful. Now, 
all that being said, it's not like Carla Esparza can't win this fight. I think that if she does want to win, she has to turn it into a dog fight, push it up against the fence. And like, honestly, I wouldn't get into too many grappling exchanges with Michelle because of her judo and because of her takedowns and because of her timing and her balance on things. I would, if I'm Carla, I'm back. I'm trying to cut Michelle off. I'm trying to keep her back against the cage. And I'm trying to keep this in boxing range. And I'm not afraid to mix in takedowns, but I'm not just going to hunt for it to put the, put it there. You know what I mean? So, for Michelle Watterson, much more of a karate fight when she's standing and then relying on her judo game and stuff. And just frustrating Carla, I think, is the uh, the game plan for her. And Carla's game plan is going to be more like you just got to you gotta turn it into a brawl, turn it into a dogfight, and kind of break through that in order to get into the range that you need to for Michelle. Don't let her set up kicks and stuff early and establish it because once she establishes it, you're going to – now you have to work out of a hole. So I, I would kind of expect Carla to be aggressive early on in this fight. Okay, moving on. We now have Fabricio Verdum, who is unranked according to the website, but obviously one of the great, according to the UFC website, but obviously one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. Um, he's taken on Alexi Olenek, who's currently ranked number 12. And between these two, I mean, goddamn, I don't even know how many submission ones they have. I guess I could look it up for you guys, right? That would make sense. But uh, let me see. Alexi. Lenick. I know he's got like over 50 wins on his resume. 58, 13, and 1. Let's see how many submission wins. 46 of those wins have come by way of submission. So these two combined, I don't even know. I mean, how many does Fabricio Verdum have in his career, right? Uh, sorry, I should have already had this pulled up before I started talking about it, but 11 wins by submission. But he's also got some knockouts on there and uh, this fight's kind of hard to pick. I think if you look at it on paper, like the appeal is that they're both submission artists, but I just think the difference is that like Fabricio is one of the best. I think his boxing is a little bit more crisp than Ale Alexi's. And I just don't think like when you watch a lot of Alexi Linux submissions, it's not that they're not well set up and it's not that they're not brilliant. It's they're very creative, but it is more of like he gets guys in these like almost tricky situations where you wouldn't expect to be submitted like from the bottom of mount with an ezekiel where i i don't think that stuff is going to work on a high level grappler like fabricio verdum and like you've seen verdum's hands and stuff and you know knocking out Cain velasquez i just think that this is a tough fight stylistically for olenek to win because it's not that he doesn't have power in his hands but his his striking is going to come from these wide looping angles, whereas I think Fabricio Verdum is going to come straight down the pipe with more with more stuff. I think his boxing will be better. I just think that this is too much of a challenge for Alexi Olenek to overcome. Like I said, I don't think he has a very good chance of tapping Fabricio on the feet. I mean, the, the ground is Fabricio Verdum's world, and I think I just said tapping him on the feet. I don't think he has a chance to tap him, and I think Fabricio will have an advantage on the feet. Anyway, I'm taking Fabricio over Doom in this one. I could see it going to decision, but I could also see Verdum just overwhelming Olenek, tiring him out, submitting him, or knocking him out via ground and pound. But I got Verdum in this one. I, this one just feels like, to me, it feels like a, mid, a, a mismatch. Like, not that Olenek's not good, not that he can't threaten, but it feels like Fabricio over Doom has the upper hand going into this fight, to me at least. Okay, we're going to move on to the main event for the prelims, for the prelims, right, on ESPN. And this is going to be a welterweight bout between Anthony Pettis and Cowboy Cerrone. Now, Cowboy is obviously riding a losing streak. He's lost to Conor McGregor. He's lost to, uh, I have it written down, Justin Gaethje and then Tony Ferguson before that. So, I mean, all to the top guys in the division, right? Like, I don't think you're going to argue that any of those guys aren't top five. But... It makes you a little bit nervous, man. I mean, knocked out pretty brutally, too, against against Gaethje and against Connor. I mean, those are hard knockouts. And, like, the fight against Tony, he probably could have kept fighting. But, you know, the whole swollen eye shit. It's so, I, this is a rematch, too, right? And these guys fought a long time ago. And Anthony Pettis kind of switched off to the southpaw stance. And if you go watch that fight, it's, Joe Rogan called it perfectly. Like Pettis switched off to the southpaw stance and started firing kicks to that body. And that's what ended up ending the fight. Like he saw the opening there and he had the power kick coming from the left-hand side and he was just driving it uh, into the fucking 
side of Cowboy Cerrone, like into his ribs, and, and it, it eventually ended up ending the fight, right? And Cowboy's been susceptible to the body before, especially because of all that fucking shit that he had going on with his, like, guts. I, I don't know what the fuck happened. Didn't he have, like, a certain amount of, like, length of his intestines removed or some shit like that? So, like, people know that about him. And to me, like, the biggest difference in this fight between these two fighters is that Cowboy is probably going to mar- – I don't mean to say that Cowboy is not creative. Please don't take this the wrong way. Like, But I do think – like, Cowboy's creative in how he sets things up and how he, like – how he gets his combinations. Like, the combination that he landed on, I think it was, like, Rick Story, right? Beautiful, gorgeous. I mean, the way he set it up. Can't say that's not creative. But – Anthony Pettis is much more willing to try wild and spontaneous things, I guess, in the octagon or, and just, there's more variety and there's more flash to what he does. And I think that's going to be the biggest difference maker in this fight. Um, I think that Pettis's creativity will throw Cowboy off. Like it's going to just be, he's going to overwhelm him with possibilities. Whereas Cowboy is going to rely on the, like coming forward, throwing classic Muay Thai, like kickboxing combinations and trying to set like, He's trying to set a clean combination up, whereas Anthony Pettis will launch off the fucking cage or do, like, axe kicks and rolling thunder. Not literally. But he, you know what I mean, though. He'll do – he'll pull crazy shit out of his ass. And it lands, and I think that that's going to give Cowboys some trouble and it'll confuse him. I think that's why you kind of saw him get confused against the shoulder strikes of Connor. Like, he looked almost confused when it hit him. Obviously, he's rock, right? He broke his fucking orbital bone. But, like – I think that Cowboy just relies on a much more traditional path to success. Now, another interesting thing that we might see in this fight is a ground war because do- both of these guys have very slept on jiu-jitsu. Donald Cerrone, I'm going to give the advantage to him in wrestling. I'm going to give the jiu-jitsu advantage, believe it or not, to Anthony Pettis. Anthony Pettis is so fucking good off his back. I mean, the way he sets things up is like, if you look at the fucking, I think he hit him with an arm bar, maybe an arm bar triangle. Again, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but when he tapped Kies out from the bottom, I mean, he tapped Benson Henderson out from the bottom with the arm bar. I mean, Anthony Pettis' jujitsu is fucking solid, rock solid. And people forget about it because he's so advanced on the feet and so threatening up there, right? Now, all that. I, I don't. I think it'll be hard for Anthony Pettis to tap Cowboy because his ground game is so solid. I think you might see a lot of really interesting transitions if it goes there. Um, but one thing to keep in mind about Anthony Pettis, and this has kind of been the like, you. I hate to say this about a fighter because I'm not a fighter. I don't go in there and I don't do it. Like I don't go into the octagon and strap the gloves up and like go through that whole entire process. I can't even imagine how fucking stressful it all is, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying that I have the balls to do it, right? But you can kind of break Anthony Pettis mentally, it seems. Um, Like Tony Ferguson, Poirier, uh, RDA. Like when you start running through him and really just putting heavy pressure on him, he doesn't have the space in a similar way to Uriah Hall, right? Like he needs space to be his most creative and his most effective. Cowboy has to eliminate that space a little bit and just like I said, it's okay to keep things like it's it, there's nothing wrong with keeping like a traditional like kickboxing or Muay Thai style right when you're fighting a guy like Pettis I think Cowboy probably leans a little more towards kickboxing style like as opposed to Muay Thai but I think that the way you beat Pettis is you got to put pressure on a man and Cowboy has to keep the volume coming and he can't really be waiting on things from Pettis because that's where Pettis is going to start to find the openings and the holes. He's really good at exploiting those. And when he starts getting his timing and things start happening on I, – I, Pettis is one of w- – someone needs to do a case study on Pettis because there will be fights where like – I would love to know what the like what's going on in his mind because there will be fights where Anthony Pettis fights and I go, man, you're not going to be able to beat this fucking guy. Like – He'll, when he gets into a zone and he gets into a rhythm, he is one of the biggest problems in the UFC. No doubt about it. Anthony Pettis is like my definition of a rhythm fighter. When he gets going, good luck, man. I mean, see, I I know it doesn't happen all the time, but you can just tell that when he gets into that zone, he's in a place that other guys just aren't, right? Um, Like I said, caveat there is that you can sometimes get I don't know if he mentally I don't know what's going on in there man I'm not there I'm not him and I don't want to accuse him but I just like I bring this question up all the time 
had the position been reversed do you, and Tony Ferguson broke his hand, do you think Tony Ferguson would have even brought it up to his corner? I think he just would have fought through it. I mean, that's my personal take on it. That's what I mean, though. Like, I'm not doing it to be disrespectful to Anthony, and I'm certainly not saying that, like, I would want to be in a cage against Tony Ferguson with a broken hand. Not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that there are guys like Tony Ferguson out there that don't give a fuck. So, you can – Cowboy needs pressure. He needs constant volume. And he needs to ne- – if you let Pettis get into a rhythm, it, it's going to be a long night for Cowboy or a quick night meaning that he's going to get finished or he's going to he's going to get a clinic put on him man Pettis is that good but it's all about disrupting the rhythm if Cowboy disrupts the rhythm I think he has a chance to win and if Pettis is able to get into a rhythm I think he's going to make it look fairly easy so we'll see I'm officially going to take Pettis uh by decision or maybe like um, I could see him finishing Cowboy as well I don't think he'll tap him out I think he could knock him out um yeah, and like if if Cowboy is going to win this fight, pressure, 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 volume, 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 volume. Like you got to keep the gas on, man. And uh, you might get Pettis to, we- to to weather a little bit, right? Whittle, whatever the fucking word is. <laughs> All right, but I think that wraps it up. Like I said, I got to hop off here, and I got to uh, I've got a few more notes to get ready for the main card. I'll drop a podcast for that maybe later tonight, but probably tomorrow by the time I get everything ready and kind of compile everything that I want to talk about. But, um, yeah, like I said, uh, at the beginning of the podcast, we just crossed the hundred subscriber line. So thank all of you guys so much. If you guys are interested in the podcast, um, please hit the subscribe button so you can keep up to date with everything. Um, what else? Oh, if you are listening right now on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from, uh, this is also available on YouTube. So check us out there and obviously vice versa. If you have, if you're watching on YouTube and you just want to hear the audio, we have a, uh, this thing is distributed across like most major podcasting plat- platform services like Spotify, iTunes, uh, Google Play Store, et cetera, right? So let's see, anything else, anything else? I think I covered it. Um, as always, leave your opinions in the comment section. Let me know who you guys, thinks are, who, who you guys think is going to win the fights. And uh, yeah, have a good day. Thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye.